Hello, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining the first of the National Environmental Health Association's Body Art Webinar Series, Body Art Blueprint, a guide for health inspectors in adopting model codes. Today, we'll explore the major updates made to the 2024 Body Art Model Code. We'll hear from two regulators who've utilized the Body Art Model Code when updating Body Art regulations in their jurisdictions. You'll hear about what worked for them, what didn't, and what to be aware of when updating body art regulations in your jurisdiction. I'm Sadie Sherpheim, a project coordinator for the National Environmental Health Association. It's my pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Please note this webinar, including the chat, is being recorded. If you're not comfortable with this, you may disconnect at this time. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All participants are in listen-only mode, but we welcome you to utilize the chat throughout the presentation to connect with fellow attendees. We will have time for questions at the end and ask that you please write your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as time permits. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today, Catherine Martinez and Austin Addison. Catherine is a sanitarian specialist at the Kent County Health Department in Michigan, located on the west side of the state. She's been working with MIHA since 2015 on updating the Body Art Model Code, and since began working with the Association of Food and Drug Officials Body Art Work Groups as well. Catherine is also a member of the work group charged with updating the state of Michigan Body Art Regulations. Prior to joining Kent County Health Department in 2014, Catherine was volunteering as a nationally registered advanced emergency medical technician. Austin is an environmental health specialist working in Georgia where he reviews, permits, and, is, and inspects facilities, including body art facilities. He is currently the NEHA Body Art Committee Regulatory Co-Chair and is an instructor for the Body Art Facility Inspector Training. All right, and before I hand it over to them, just a little bit of history on our body art model code. We first published the Body Art Model Code in 1998, and it was created as a guidance document for jurisdictions that were starting to develop regulations in response to the growing practice of body art. The Body Art Model Code is a resource that state, local, tribal, and territorial agencies can use to develop, update, or enhance their own body art codes. As the only comprehensive model that addresses current body art practices and public health risks, the Body or Model Code is an essential resource for environmental health programs. Our Body Art Committee updated the code in 2019 with a supporting annex that provides the scientific rationale for the code. The updated Body or Model Code was created with input from environmental health and industry professionals and addresses the ways body art impacts public health. <clears throat> Excuse me. We since updated the Body Art Model Code and published it in March of 2024, and it is now available for use. With that, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Catherine and Austin, and I'll hand it up to Hey, everybody. I will be going first. Like Sadie mentioned, um, we're on the NEHA Body Art Committee, and something that we've just been putting a lot of work into recently is updating the model body art code. And that's one of the reasons why we're wanting to do this too. We want to tell you guys about the updates that we've got and how you guys can, can use this in your jurisdictions. And so just to give you guys a quick update of, of the model body art code and everything we've changed, uh, we've added a lot of definitions. So we've received 53 definition change requests. So when we update the model code, anybody can put in comments for what should be changed or how things should be written. Um, and so we did get requests for 53 definitions and we've added 15 of particular note that might be of a lot of interest to a lot of you guys is we have provided definitions and some guidance on cosmetic tattooing, like microblading. Um, we've talked about, we've updated things about waste requirements with biomedical waste, which I'll talk about here a little bit as well later on. Um, we've talked about facility docu uh, documentation requirements which includes clients and requirements for I'm sorry, I have notes, guys. I'm getting lost in my notes. Don't worry about me. Um, I don't know. We've updated the, the requirements for documentation for facilities, and we've also provided guidance and recommendations for facility, physical facility requirements as well. And so just with that kind of little update about the model body art code, we'll We'll get more into the, the weeds of it here in a second. I'm going to hand it over to Catherine, though, as we go forward. 
Thank you, Austin. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Again, I'm with the state of Michigan. Or I work for a local health department in the state of Michigan, and we have been working on updating our regulations. So that's kind of my perspective as we work through this. Before you start diving into everything, you want to have a plan of what you're going to do. And that plan should involve familiarizing yourself with how you are going to legally be able to enforce these regulations. If there is a law that will allow you to do it, or if that is something that you will need to be able, or you will need to um, implement in order to enforce the regulations. So in Michigan, for example, we have the Public Health Act that has the body art law, which is what allows us to enforce the body art regulations is what we are updating. And there are certain aspects of the law, like certain definitions that are included that would be nice to update, but that would be a very intensive and challenging endeavor. And so right now to do things as quickly and efficiently as possible, we are, um, up just updating the regulations. But we have to keep in mind continuously that there are certain parts of the law that we have to remember um, will always kind of override what the regulations are. And definitions are a big part of that. So be aware of what you already have and how that's going to affect what you can adopt. And to keep in mind too, for us, whatever regulations we're adopting is going to affect the entire state. And so it's not just a local um, local jurisdiction enforcement with these regulations. So once you know what you have, then you will want to um, familiarize yourself with the model code. So go through the model code Try to understand exactly what is written. And if there are anything that you don't quite get the why behind, refer to the annex. Familiarize yourself with the annex that has a lot of great resources, um, scientific articles, studies, and use that as a reference to help you understand the importance of and the justification of what was put into the model code. And also familiarize yourself with the references that we have in the model code, such as the OSHA requirements and standards, ASTM standards for jewelry, and um, the U.S. Department of Labor discussing the artist minimum age requirements. And if you have any questions, there's a whole work group of us that have worked on the model code. And there's individuals, obviously, from regulators to people who are in the industry who have a lot of different perspectives and experiences with this and are more than happy to be an assistance as you're going through this and answer questions and do what we can to help help you guys update your regulations. NEHA also releases policy statements as well relating to body art. So keep that in mind. Um, I know ear piercing is a big one. And that's something that we definitely have um, encountered in Michigan. And so we have released policy statements on that. And that can also help you provide um, guidance and rationale for what you want to adopt. And then I'll hand it over to Austin real quick. Cool. And just to add on to what Catherine was saying to you guys, don't you you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? So when we're talking about understanding the why, you know, we we do this in other programs, right? Most of us probably inspect restaurants, most of us probably inspect pools. We've got our codes, we've got the FDA code that we can go to for guidance. We have interpretation manuals. If you have the um if you go to the Niha Body Art website, you have the model code, but we have the annex which is similar to an interpretation manual and tells you the reasoning behind it. Uh, whenever we're here in a second, we'll start talking about what to adopt. When you talk to artists and politicians or local governments about why body art rules should be adopted, we need to make sure we have that scientific understanding and the practical use of that information. That way it 
we can support why we should be adopting these things instead of just coming up with, you know, we're regulating things because we're the government, you know, we got to make sure that we, we have backing and that what we're doing is, is, has a foundation in protecting public health. Um, so kind of going to the next one, we're going to talk about what to adopt. And so when you guys registered, there are a lot of questions. You guys were allowed to ask questions and we had questions about adopting sections or adopting by references or how to, how to go about that process at all. Uh, what's important to understand is if you look at the model body art code, you don't have to adopt the whole thing. You can pick and choose what works for your municipality. So maybe you might say, hey, this is a really good idea, but this is a really big jump, right? There, There's too much. It would be too much of a change for our, our local rules and regulations for our businesses. It just wouldn't be feasible. Then, then don't or meet it in the middle. You can adopt by code or by reference if you want, but you need to do what's practical and what works for you guys. And the goal isn't to become perfect overnight by adopting new rules. The goal is to just be better than you were before and to always be on that path of protecting public health better than we were yesterday. Um, and so talking about adopting the code, Catherine had mentioned that she is on the her state's committee for adopting rules and working on that that work group. And so I'll kind of let her share her experience here. Yeah. So what we, our process, right? Uh, obviously I'm familiar with the model code um, and I wanted to make sure that the group that we put together, which by the way, this work group was equally represented by regulators from all over the state. It was open to everyone and it was also opened up to the artists and the industry personnel as well because their perspective is so so important so we had that work group put together the first step was working through the model code reading it understanding it and doing that side-by-side -side comparison with the law so that way we knew right off the bat if we couldn't put a big x through certain parts that we knew we could not adopt so we worked through that highlighted what we liked crossed out what we didn't or what we couldn't take. And then we pulled up our regulations, went through, made any just apparent changes that we knew we needed to make. And then we decided, we started working in the sections of the model code. We would say, you know, all right, this is a good, this is a good spot to put this information or this is where we should put this. And the model code also helped us reorganize our regulations quite a bit as well. And so that was very helpful to kind of restructure it. And we weren't just looking at what we could pull from the model code. We were doing an overall, how do we improve our regulations as well of what was existing. And like Austin was saying, and this is so important, is we definitely got hung up on it a lot where you don't have to straight copy paste the model code right that is not what is needed to do it is there as a guidance it is there to show you what we think are the best practices and the annex is there to show you why and i have some examples of what we did kind of compromise on so the temporary body art facilities in the body art model code it states that there should be 50 square feet per artist. Well, currently in the state of Michigan regulations, there isn't a minimum number of artists or maximum number of artists per station. So our compromise was to say that you couldn't have more than two artists within an 80 square feet area. So we didn't do what would have been 100 square feet if we would have balanced right with the model code. We did 80 and for two people. And that was also based off of what the sizes traditionally are of a booth at a convention. So we tried to keep that in mind as well. Another example is in the proposed state of Michigan updates, what we have written is to keep, when we're talking about hygiene, keeping the fingernails short with smooth filed edges to allow thorough cleaning and prevent glove tear. 
that is verbatim from the model code. But what we didn't include from that section from the model code was the statements about body artists must not wear artificial fingernails or extenders and natural tips must be less than one eighth of an inch long. Nail polish must be intact without chips or cracks and must be removed and replaced ever every seven days. That was a statement that we could not um, come to an agreement on and felt that we would have had extreme difficulty enforcing and a lot of the artists didn't find it to be um, a need for us to implement. Even though if you refer to the annex, we have some great actual studies that explain why that would be important, but we compromised, right? It's still better to just have something in there about hand hygiene and fingernails than it is nothing at all. Baby steps. And so Austin, I know you've worked through it as well. If you want to share any of your difficulties. Yeah. So Catherine and I spoke about this when we were going through everyone's questions that we had during registration that you guys had. And it asked about dealing with county commissioners and state lawyers and governors and kind of off the off the bat, I'll tell you guys deciding what to adopt and how to adopt can be difficult because of those local politics, because of state politics, even here in Georgia. So originally, however many years ago, we had a law that said, hey, the health department is going to regulate body art facilities. There was no requirement for a state rule, though. It just said, hey, the local health departments have to regulate it. So there's 150 something counties and there were 150 something different rules. Every county had their own thing. Some counties required physical, some didn't. Some had, you know, only physical facility requirements and others had autoclave and bloodborne pathogen training, right? It was it was completely random kind of across the state. Over time, kind of grouped up together and everyone around each other had similar rules, but it wasn't consistent. And so one of the problems that we had were a few things. For some of the counties that had very lax rules, when we started updating the rule to a statewide code, they had some major changes that had to be made. They were not close to what the new rule was going to be. And so there were a lot of artists who were upset with this. There were some artists, our, our state took the stance of um, the Model Body Art Code and the Association of Professional Piercers, the APP, and we said, hey, this is the standard for jewelry. This is what we require. And we had lots of public comments about that. Like, what about Japanese standards? What about Chinese standards? Well, you're excluding these standards. And the state kind of just had to put their foot down and say no. On the flip side of that, though, there were things that we didn't know who had jurisdiction over them, which caused problems. So we had adopted rules about biohazardous waste and red bags and sharps and things like that. But at the end of the day, we don't have authority over that. That was our state's Department of Natural Resources who regulates that. And we had to defer to them to make that rule. We couldn't. We just, we didn't have the authority to require anything with that. And so a big problem that you'll have is working with a, finding all the people who need to be involved and I'm trying to think of a good way to word this. Trying to get as many people onto at least as close of the same page as possible. At least the same chapter. We might not all be on the same page, but we should be on the same chapter, okay? Uh, it's, it's hard, especially when rules are taking a big update or like Catherine said, if you don't want to do a big update, maybe you have to meet them in the middle. That that really is going to be some of your biggest problems, I would say, when deciding what to adopt. Yes, and Austin, you brought up a point that I wanted to touch on to Michigan. We have a wide variety of areas and districts that we're regulating. So where I'm at in Kent County, we have... I'm, just under 150 body art facilities, but majority of the counties only have a couple, like five or under. 
and very rural. And so when we're talking about certain requirements, they felt very overwhelmed. And there were certain um, situations where they thought that it was going to be asking too much of the artists. And having the artists on the work group and being a part of that was so helpful because they were able to explain to these regulators that actually, no, that's not going to be a huge hindrance. That's not going to put us out. It's actually something that we do already, or it will only require a slight change to what we're already doing. So having the perspective of everyone in the, all of the different um, areas that you this regulation is going to affect is really important. So that way you can work through those certain situations where they might feel overwhelmed. And then let's say it does come out, it does get adopted. It doesn't get hit with a lot of resistance and hesitancy because you've already rationalized that. Yeah. And with that, I think we should kind of just roll into the next slide too. We're kind of mixing yeah. the slides together, but, and to answer the question in chat, talking about statewide or local, I think that ends up being one of the problems is that that line between state and local can be blurred sometimes. Um, a lot of states have mixed regulatory authorities, or even if local health departments hold the ultimate authority, state law still usually trumps whatever the local people want to do anyway. And so it, there's a, that's part of being on the same page or the same chapter, however we're going to talk about it, is making sure that the health department's on the same page, the local health departments are on the same page, that the state, whoever is over public health states on the same page, that your department of natural resources, or if you've got OSHA things, right? Uh, when you're making body art rules, you might say, you know, we don't care if they're bloodborne pathogen trained. Well, that doesn't mean that OSHA doesn't care. Whatever we're writing doesn't necessarily trump what other departments or agencies rules are. And sometimes we just need to be aware of that. And so it can make it difficult both for local jurisdictions and state ones as well. Um. And was that your experience at, in Michigan, Catherine? Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're, I feel like it was easier for us having that overall encompassing law for the entire state because it forced us all to come together. And that was helpful. So we all had each other's viewpoints but it was going to be a clear set of guidance once it, it is updated. And I know that that makes a big difference for artists as well, knowing that if for some of them, you know, moving a mile means they're going to go into a different county, which is going to be a different regulating authority. And so if you're in a state where that would mean you may be regulated or you may not be regulated, it could be difficult. So even if you don't have that overlying law, that would mean the whole state is uniform in their regulations. Trying to get some semblance of similarity between the jurisdictions around you is incredibly helpful too. And then when you have that and you have a large group of unity with those regulations, it can help push for an overall state law as well, saying that, look, we're already doing this. We're all already doing this. And it can be a way to show that it it is practical, it is doable, and it is important having everyone together on it. Something else that I would I would kind of take from that too, talking about having a statewide rule. If you're coming from only local jurisdictions and now your state's getting a new rule, or even if you're just updating your rules locally, make sure that when you are updating your rules, don't jump the gun with anything. I think that this was a challenge for us was sure the new rule has come out and we can see, you know, in black and white what the verbiage is, but do we have interpretations? Do we have guidance? Do we have handouts and checklists that we can hand out? Pushing out new rules before you're really ready to implement them 
can cause frustration for body artists and for the regulators that have to enforce these rules. If you push out new code and you're like, all right, guys, here it is. And the inspectors take it at face value and they start enforcing these rules. And then three months later, you come out and you go, wow, we've we've interpreted it. We've thought about it. And, and we've talked to people and this is how we're actually going to implement this. Well, now they're coming back to the body artists and the facilities that they regulate and they're saying, hey, I know I told you this two months ago, but that's that's not true anymore. I, I didn't lie to you. They just the, the state changed their mind. And and that can cause problems too. And so it might be a good idea to make sure that you have the whole kit and caboodle ready to go before you're pushing it out out to the streets to be worked on. And that could be the actual code, that could be the interpretation, that could be making sure applications are done or that you have samples or examples to hand out. I think that that would be a, I don't think, I, I would say that that is a big problem. And that was something that I saw here, at least at the local level in Georgia, was as interpretations changed or ideas changed that it caused a lot of frustrations for both the inspectors and regulators. Yes, I, part of what we're doing too is updating our um, inspection forms and then the guidance documents that we have as well as such as consent forms and aftercare. And I know that NEHA is also working. We're doing some of that too. Um, I've been working with Sadie and other members of the committee for a plan review packet as well. And I want to also um, bring up a topic and this came up when we had people from more rural areas who only had like very limited services offered at their body art facilities. As we're going through um, the model code and we're talking about certain types of piercings and branding and scarification, it was parts that were thought, maybe we don't need to worry about this. Let's move past it. Let's not try to figure this out because we don't have anyone who deals with this. And remember that just because no one's doing it right now doesn't mean they might not start doing it later and you don't want to have to scramble and be like well i guess there's nothing in here that says you can't do that but now that you are doing it we don't have any guidance on how to make sure that you're doing it safely so keep in mind of the different procedures that and different equipment and everything that is out there and you don't want to pigeonhole yourself by giving too much specifics, but you also want to make sure that you are going to be able to regulate all of the practices that you might come across. And I, I think to kind of add on to that, what she was saying is definitions are important. You know, earlier when, you know, a few slides ago when we were talking about the new code, you know, we've added a lot of definitions in the, the body art model code and there's I like to think they're flushed out, but I'm biased. I'm on the committee. What can I say? Um, but but they are important, right? I've I've met inspectors from all across the country, and I've talked to industry from all across the country. And you have some inspectors that just say body art is defined as any modification to the body, and they have regulation over literally anything and everything. And I've talked to industry who gets frustrated because their definition of tattooing is is traditional tattooing. And that doesn't cover cosmetic tattooers. And they and so cosmetic tattooers in their jurisdiction aren't regulated, but they are. And then I have other places that define body art as, as only, you know, inserting inks and pigments under the skin. And yet, so then they don't regulate piercings. Like she said, we, you don't want to be too specific and make it to where you're not regulating things that could harm public health. But you don't want to be, you don't want to be too broad either. The definitions that you make are important. And I guess this kind of goes into the next slide too, is you have resources. You've got the model body art code. You've got states who have adopted codes. You have states who have started from the ground up and made their own thing. You're not alone. We're never alone in environmental health. You've got, you know, your state affiliates, you know, your state environmental health association. You have your national environmental health association. You've got committees and there's always people here willing to help you, uh, who will who are offer who are willing to offer their time to help you guys make whatever works for you guys, and it's it's just important to to not shoot yourself in the foot by trying to either be too strict or not strict enough when you're updating your codes. 
Yeah, the purpose of this body art model code and the annex and all the guidance documents that we're putting out there is to give everyone a starting point. And even though we've put that out there, this webinar series and what we're putting on today, the point of that is so you don't feel overwhelmed and you don't feel alone in looking at the regulations because it is a lot, especially if you don't have any right now. And it can be very overwhelming. And we want you to know that it can be done. It has been done. And that it did take a lot of, especially in my situation, um, a lot of different people from a lot of different programs, departments working together. And you have help all over the country with what you want to do. And you have resources and don't hesitate to use them. And I, I think another big thing that I just want to reemphasize, maybe we're talking in circles, but I, I think I think it's reiterating these points are what's really important. And it's you know, working towards a compromise, meeting our artists in the middle where we can on things that maybe we can build to in the future, utilizing the people available to you, using whatever resources are available to you. And um they I thought myself in a circle and I lost my point. I'm sorry. I was just saying I, it's it's important to to be able to have what's available to you and use it um, to to be better than where you're at right now. And you don't have to adopt everything, right? If you guys are satisfied with your tattoo rules, right? Say, well, we've we cover microblading, we cover tattooing, we cover piercing, and I think they're perfect. Well, we've got stuff for branding and scarification. Or if you think maybe your tattoo rules are good and your piercing rules are good, but you need help with cosmetic tattooing, you can pick and choose what you need to to customize your rules for your jurisdiction. We know this with the food code and with septic and all these other things. It's not one size fits all in environmental health. It's it it's wildly different across the country. The people we interact with, the cultures we interact with, the environment around us is totally different. And you have to be able to take a what's available to you and tailor it to your community and your state that you're trying to help. And don't feel defeated if you can't. Doing it all at once probably isn't going to be an option. I mean, we've had regulate body art regulations since 2009. And we're still slowly increasing. I don't want to say increasing. We're still slowly adding to our information and how we can best regulate. And so it's a process and it probably isn't going to be a very quick process either. And that's okay. But always remember every, every change is a positive change and that you're always going to be moving in a positive direction with this. So it might not be everything. It may not be everything you want. It might not be to the degree that you want, you know, talk about spore testing weekly in the model code. You know, maybe you don't even require spore testing at all on your autoclave. So even just a monthly is going to be a big win. Um, take those wins when you can get them. And it can be very overwhelming for um, legislature to see a huge stack of regulations where there weren't any before. So if you do need to ease um, ease them into the idea of regulating, that's okay. It's something, it's a starting point and it's a building block for the future of um, environmental health in your organization. Yeah. And that's what too, like Sadie said earlier, the first model code came out in 1998. You know, the first food code came out in the, you know, the nineties or whenever it was, right? These things are always getting updated and they're always working to improvement. You know, the body art committee with Neha has some of the smartest people I've ever met. And even they can't all agree on things, right? They're from different parts of the country and they they view things through their own lenses. And that's something that we have to to understand is that we're trying the model the model body art code tries to get as many ducks as it can without leaving anybody out. But that doesn't mean that every single duck applies to you or every quack, you know, you're quacking the same way. You're probably not. You have to take what's applying, you know to you 
and make it fit. And talking about compromise too, because Catherine mentioned talking about legislators when they see a big stack of papers. What's really important is the legislators are here to protect the public, right? They write, you know, they approve public health laws or acts or doing whatever they do to help protect the people in their state, their constituents. But what's also important to remember is that these businesses in the state are also their constituents. They have to also be worried about what we're doing, how it's going to affect their business and the, you know, the flow of money in the, you know, the local economy. If you want to come in and implement all these rules, they might be worried about how that's going to affect businesses or if that's going to push businesses out of town. And that's something else too. If you can get people on your side, if you can get the businesses that these rules are going to apply to, if you can compromise with them and all agree on it, it's probably more likely to be approved. If you can take it to your governor, if you can take it to wherever your, you know, your local commissioners and you say, hey, here's everybody who owns a body art facility in the county. Here's the rules we all agree upon. Will you take it? You probably have a better chance. Yeah, and sorry, keep kind of adding things to it. But for us here in Michigan, too, we can always remember that our law does allow the different regulating departments and agencies to have stricter requirements. So our overall regulations don't handle individual licensure artists. It's just the business. But there are different counties that have that in there where they do license individual artists. And so if there's something that you are just really passionate about, but you can't agree to it, or you know it would be a holdup in legislature, keep that in mind too, to have that option of maybe in your area that it would be really important to implement. And that's what too. And it's kind of, you know, in the vein of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? If you've got, if you don't do any spore testing right now and you're trying to get rules approved to test it once monthly, but then you also really want there to be 80 square feet of room for a body artist, but you know the whole thing is going to fail if you really push that square footage, Maybe it's important just to drop it and focus on what's really important in that moment. Again, we don't, it's it's not an all or nothing thing and it's just about being better. Also too, just as a side note, as we kind of stumble along our path and go on our soapboxes here, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A. We will answer them at the end. And so go ahead and put your questions in guys while we're, we're sitting here on our soapboxes, okay? Yes, please. And um, I think the next part is for um, Austin to kind of have a little bit of an update and the discussion as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say this real quick, Sadie, if that's okay. So we do have a Neha body art letter that gets sent out. Um, it talks about, you know, any updates to the rules, policy statements, if there's any trainings going on. Because if you are going to the NEPA conference, we do have a body art facility inspector training that we do at the conference. So just as a, a heads up, guys, that is something that we have available to us. But we do have a, 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 a newsletter that you can sign up for. We do have our webpage that Sadie just put into the chat. You guys feel free to visit it. You can see the rules, the annexes. Um, the annex is not updated yet. I think I might still be the old annex up. So keep Put, put a pin in that page, bookmark it, and come back to it in like two months, okay? Um, it's got the newsletter sign up, everything like that. Please feel free to sign up. We don't spam you. I think it comes out like once a quarter. It's not It's not going to blow up your emails. They're not going to sell it for information. Don't, you know, you only get like four emails a year. Don't worry about it, guys, okay? Just... And then I think there's a question in the Q&A for you, Catherine. And look at, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you both so much. No, you're all good. Um, and thank you for talking about the newsletter. Yes, we only do quarterly updates. So if you are interested in hearing about uh, new updates, new things that the committee is up to, feel free to subscribe. Um, and part of that is our body facility inspector training as well. So we will be holding our body art facility inspector training this July, uh, the 14th and 15th in Pittsburgh. 
Um, you can register for just the training or join us for our entire edu annual educational conference. We'll have like 250 sessions on topics from air quality to vector to body art. So uh, if you want to get those early bird rates, uh, please register before April 26th and you can visit our website to learn more. Um, and just one more note as y'all are entering questions into the chat because we do want to get to all your questions. Um, this webinar is brought to you by NEPA. Um, if you're not a member and you enjoyed this session, please consider becoming a member. You can scan the QR code or visit neha.org for more information. So yeah, with that, we can go over to questions. Um, and yeah, this first one, Catherine, is for you. Uh, asking for some clarification, they heard you mention that the regulations that you're updating would be statewide. Is that just in Michigan? Um, they're asking if they have a local ordinance and at this point, could they replace it with the body or model code once approved by their city council? So in Michigan, we have the law and that encompasses the whole state. And so these regulations that we're updating we're updating for the entire state to that would it would um be implemented in the entire state and what was the second part of the question sorry so they were asking if they wanted to adopt the body or model code uh and they just have a local ordinance at this point could they replace it with the model code once approved by city council uh they don't mention what their jurisdiction is but i don't know if you want to touch on that it would all depend on what laws are allowing you to enforce those ordinances. If it is just a local, if it is just local and you adopting that model code, is it going to interfere with any overarching laws? Then I wouldn't see why not, but you would have to know um, if that is going to compete with or um, interfere with any other laws that are within not just your area, but the state as well. I think Catherine touched on it earlier and just to maybe surmise that, sorry, Catherine, Thank is you. you guys, if your city ordinance wants to be more restrictive, you can, you just can't be less restrictive than what they're going to be putting on at the state. And so like earlier, Catherine talked about doing, you know, 60 square feet per artist instead of 80. Well, if your city is just really adamant about the 80, then maybe, you know, locally they might be able to adopt that. You just can't go less than what they've put on at the state. Thank you. Um, and next question, you mentioned earlier in the presentation about uh, involving industry uh, along the way and updating regulations. Can you both speak to how you involved industry in your jurisdictions and what channels and communications were best for them and looping them in on the update process? So I'll say two things about industry. So first, just generally speaking, we work for the government. There are public comment laws and rules and regulations that we have to follow that can vary across the country. But generally speaking, whenever you're going to be updating rules or regulations or something is going to change, it usually has to go out for public comment. And that is a time for industry to, to make comments on that. Um, if you don't have a lot of experience with body art, something I will tell you that you will find out very quickly uh, body artists are not like our other programs. They will tell you what they think and they will tell you very loudly. And not, I mean, not necessarily rude, but like they're very adamant about their opinions. And I mean that in, in the nicest way possible, right? Sometimes with restaurants or septic, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, this is what it is. And it kind of just goes on, right? Body artists are going to want to say, this is why we're doing things. Can you tell me why what you're wanting us to do is better than what we're already doing? And they're going to to ask you that. They're going to to have you justify the rule. And I don't mean that in a rude way, right? They're not, by and large, like all of our other programs, they're wonderfully nice. They just want you to tell them a reason. You can't just enforce and blindly enforce rules on body artists because they will tell you their opinion. And they're, they're going to tell you that they just don't agree with that. And so... Public comment is one avenue for them to do that, but it's not uncommon for local body artists to call commissioners, to show up at county commissioner meetings, to call the governor's office because they they want 
they want rules that make sense and they're going to want you to to explain why those rules make sense and why they're important and again i mean that in a nice way that's not <laughs> what i what i say when i say they they take very hard stances i mean that in the sense of like um uh, they're firm but they're not rude yeah a good example is uh, i can't think of a restaurant i've ever been in where the operator or owner knows the food code in and out, right? But you could go into majority of body art places and they're going to know the regulations in and out. And that's awesome. That is really awesome. And that is a reason that we spent so much time on the annex because we knew that we were going to have those questions and the artists that are part of the NEHA committee brought those questions to us. But then they also, they provided not just evidence for why we wanted to have a regulation, but also maybe why that wasn't necessary. Or maybe we don't want to state that because we might be putting ourselves into a box. So I love the perspective of being you know pushed and to justify because when I, as a regulator, am going into a facility and have to correct something that they're doing, I want to know exactly why I'm doing it. And that's where the annex comes in. And if that is still just not making sense, reach out to someone, one of us. We're happy to work through that and help provide some more insight as to why we believe that it's important. Yeah, and that's why I... And I'll say this too, a lot of people in the body art industry want to be regulated. They don't want scratchers. They don't want illegal body artists. They don't want, you know, people with piercing guns doing it out of their homes. They they want there to be a standard and they want that standard to be for everybody. They, they want a fair playing field. And as long, you know, the original question is what's a good way for them to interact with us? I, as long as you have public meetings, as long as you're having these county commission, you know, meetings and whatever, if you're having public comments, at least in my experience, they're going to show up. They're going to tell you. And if you don't have public meetings, they're going to show up to your office and tell you what they think. Yeah, we put it out there to um, the industry across the state as part of um, the communication with our licensing because the state has the information for everyone's licensure. One thing that we did ask, and it's something that we asked too with Neha, is that you commit. If you're going to come to, and this is more of the formal like planning process, not the public comments that Austin's referring to. This is where we're going to be meeting routinely. We ask that you do commit to that. We don't want you just popping in for a session. And the same thing with regulators. And then asking questions and throwing things off when it's something that we've already spent weeks discussing. So we always ask that they commit through the whole process, uh, we opened up that planning process to them as well, the industry. Yeah, and and we did that here too. So I remember, I guess it was years ago now at this point, it feels like years ago, um, where they sent out emails to the counties and they said, hey, who are some body artists in your jurisdictions who know your rules, who they do good, you know they do good, and that you would trust to allow public comments to go through. Um, and, and we, we took recommendations from counties about who they felt were good operators. And then emails were also sent out as well to, to registered artists. Thank you both for that insight. Uh, a question in chat, a general question from Texas. They're asking regarding photo IDs to verify age of the studio, the individual getting the body art. Is it? becoming more commonplace in your jurisdiction to accept digital IDs or copies um, or the original government issued photo ID, driver's license, passport, et cetera? Well, I, my gut reaction wants to say original copies. A problem that is coming up, it hasn't come up a lot, but I feel like it's gonna be starting more commonplace. There are some states that are only, that are allowing digital IDs now. I know um, in Georgia, either they are about to or they already have 
that there's like an app that you just log in and you log into the DDS website and that's your driver's license. You don't have to have a physical ID card anymore. Well, do you, do you screenshot it and text it to the artist? Do you hold it down on top of a photocopier and hope it photocopies? I, I, personally, in my jurisdiction, I think that it will be, become more complicated. And I would say that the stance that I personally take and that I know a lot of people take is due diligence. That as long as you're doing your due diligence to make sure that the person is of age for your jurisdiction, that they are who they say they are, that they're a parent or guardian, then you've then the the operator has done their part. It's I feel like due diligence pays a big part and it plays a big part in and at least a lot of my rules and regulations here in Georgia. I, yeah, I want to add, I am not familiar with digital IDs at all, um, but the point of that photocopying an ID is to protect the artist, right? And I will, with these new ideas and digital information, I always tell them to check with their insurance company and see what would affect, how that would affect them. You know, it. They're doing their due diligence. They're protecting themselves. It's great for us. But also, side note, I don't know how other agencies will look at that. Thank yeah, you. and kind of going on to what Tony kind of added on a question about minors and getting piercings, or there are some states where minors can get tattoos at 16 with, with parental permission. And I... I'll tell you that this is a debate that I've had with a lot of different body artists and regulators is, well, maybe you should do notary forms. I know jurisdictions where they have to go get a notary form that says that they're the parent. I have some places that say, hey, if you have their birth certificate and you have your ID and your name on your ID matches that, then it's fine. I have, or I not have, but like I know other jurisdictions that they say, hey, you've got a photocopy of their ID. They signed a paper saying that they were, you did your due diligence. I think, I don't think that there's a really good answer right now, at least from my perspective and from the conversations I've had with people across the nation. And I think a lot of it would depend on A, what your state or jurisdiction's lawyer says, and B, what the um, what the insurance policies for that shop specifically says. That's not going to affect your rules and regulations. Um, but a lot of times I'll I'll tell shops they have their records and their policies reviewed by their their either their lawyer or their their policy adjuster, whatever it is. Right. Thank you. And one more question. Looking back a little bit in the chat, they're asking about um, Austin when you were talking about taking your time with publishing regulations and providing supplemental documents, um, asking if those documents could be made available. Um, and in addition to that, just a question about how you work with industry to ensure implementation of updated regulations within the set time frame. and any tips y'all have on that. Yes. So I will say that at least the regulations and the stuff that we have for Georgia are available online on you can type in Georgia DPH body art should hopefully be the first hit. Um, we have a checklist that we created. The state created it. I didn't create it. Um, the state created it. And that way body artists and facilities and operators can kind of go through the checklist. And it says for your client evaluation, does it say A, B, C, D, so-and-so? Does your policies, does it cover this? Does it cover whatever? Um, and between updates at the body art committee for NEHA, that is one of our things that we've talked about addressing. Um, and so, yes, the stuff for Georgia's posted. B, keep an eye out. Maybe maybe that's why you should sign up for the newsletter. Maybe we will have stuff. It's a secret. We won't tell you. You should sign up for the newsletter and you'll find out. Um, but we talk about working with other jurisdictions, people who have gone through the process. Look, Google it. Steal it. Google, Google every jurisdiction around you and steal their stuff off their website. Do, you know, steal it. If it works, it works. You know, again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then what was the other part of the question, Sadie? I'm so sorry. Yeah, just talking about implementing the regulations within a set time frame. How do you ensure compliance? 
that's a tough one. We're going through that right now. So our rules were signed April 4th, 2023, I think. And they go into final effect October 4th or 6th of this year. And at, at least in at least in my county, it's been a lot of hand holding, a lot of monthly emails. Hey guys, don't forget to submit this documentation. Don't forget to do this. And I think that this is where it comes important to evaluate how you want to be as an inspector in a jurisdiction is we have every authority to say April or October rolls around like, ah, you guys didn't turn it in. You got to close. We, we told you. But taking the time, you know, once a month to follow up with them and say, hey, I still don't have these or taking two hours out of your day to go to the shop and sit with them and go over, you know, the drafts for the policies. That means a lot to these artists. It shows them that you're on the same team. And so in ensuring that they come into compliance in the time frame, take an active stance. Don't just say, I'm the government, I'm telling you to do it, and that is that, because you're not going to get any respect. You're not going to get compliance. And it's going to be your problem anyway in October when you have to go, or you know, whenever your rules become effect, you'd have to go shut them down and it's your problem anyway. Helping them, even if even if it is hand-holding, even if you think it's a nuisance, in the long term, it's going to build better rapport and it's going to build better compliance. And at the end of the day, our job isn't to shut places down or to be an iron fist. It's to protect the public. And if being a little more involved in the creation of their policies and, and helping them come into compliance is needed, then that's what I'm going to do to protect public health. I'll let Catherine give her spiel because I'm sure she's going through this now. <laughs> yeah, ours have not um, been signed yet, but... I always you know, recommend that you do put in there a grace period, you know, actually write it into the regulations like facilities will have six months a year, however long to comply. And that allows you to put it out there, what the regulations are and work through it with them. And also, let's say you do give them a year to comply. You go out there for their inspection. It's been a year and they're still not quite where they need to be. Work with them. My goodness, work with them. They've been operating for how long differently or maybe without any regulations. And our job is to know the regulations. There's a whole you know line of work just for regulation, interpretation, understanding. That's our jobs. It's complicated. It is confusing. And taking that time and doing that is going to go a long, long way. An hour of your time can be now to be saving you weeks of your time later. Thank you both. I think we have time for one quick final question. From Kira, how would you both recommend encouraging body artists to connect with their state reps concerning body art codes? So, uh, I would say for most jurisdictions, one of the things that we have is we, at, at least here in Georgia, the local inspectors don't have say over how things are, are done. And so all we can tell people is, hey, you should call your state rep and they would have to get that information online. And at least in my experience, I know a lot of body artists where if you say, hey, contact your state rep, they will. You know, there's there's a body artist with um, the Alliance of Professional Tattooers, the APT, that he got every dang near every body artist in his state to keep calling the governor until they, you know, signed a law and made it work. And the governor's office was like, please stop. We, we signed it. Um Again, body artists want to be regulated. They want a level playing field with all of the body artists. They want their they want to be safe. You know, they don't want to spread diseases. And if you say, "Hey, I'm not the right person to talk to. You need to talk to the governor's office or you need to talk to your state rep or you need to talk to the commissioners." As long as you can point them at who the right person is to talk to, they'll probably they probably will. Just real quick, 
the voice of someone who is going to be regulated by a set of regulations is so much louder and more impactful than the voice of the person who's going to be doing that regulating. So when you have explaining to um, the artists that just one or two of them calling is going to be more impactful than having four different jurisdictions call is a really important point to make to them. They, their voice is so much louder than they think it is. And they probably feel like it isn't as impactful as it actually is because for years and years they felt, I know for us, you know, body art is always like that secondary program, right? No one's ever fully involved in body art. So they've always kind of felt neglected as an industry. And in the cases of wanting more oversight, that voice is going to have a huge impact. And they're the ones who can do um, can do the most in that regard. And I'm so sorry, Sadie. I know we're running out of time. Well, I'll add on to that one really quick comment too, because I think Catherine brings up a really important point is a lot of artists in my state, I feel like are very vocal and that might not be true for your jurisdiction. Like Catherine said, you know, environmental health is already the redheaded stepchild of public health. Well, body art is the redheaded, you know, it's the black sheep of the redheaded stepchildren. And sometimes body artists feel like that. Sometimes they don't feel like they're going to be heard. Um, you know, maybe they feel like they're the odd ones out. I think if you let them know that what they say is important, that their experiences are important, and that if they call the right people, that their opinion is going to be heard, I think that that is going to be meaningful and help stir them to to take that action. Thank you. Thank you both so much for answering all the questions and offering your time and perspective and insight on today's call. Really appreciate both of you. Uh, and of course, thank you to all the attendees for your time and questions and participation, and to all regulatory and industry professionals working to ensure a safe body art across the nation. Thank you all for joining, and we'll see you next time.